This is an ABC podcast. Just quickly before we kick off, Earshot's got some news, so stick around until the end of the program to hear the goss. OK, on with the show. I have a question for you I think I know the answer to. Do you own a set of headphones, any kind, earbuds, over-the-ear, wired, wireless? Chances are you do, and you might even be wearing them right now, listening to me. I'm Iyuki Yoki Ranta, and this earshot goes deep inside your eardrum to explore one of our key senses, hearing. Today, comedian David Rose explores what it means to be, quote, half deaf and the darker side of one of the most common consumer goods. Let's join David on a deep dive inside the eardrum. All he asks is that you hear him out. Can you hear me properly? Do I need to speak up or slower? Is it too loud in here? Sorry, I know it must be really annoying for you. It's so impressive how you deal with all of this. I've heard versions of this every day for the last 28 years. Every outing with friends, every party, brunch, lunch, dinner, every work meeting. Don't even get me started on romantic situations. Unfortunately, that's life when you have hearing loss. I was diagnosed with hearing loss when I was five years old. Well, diagnosed is a bit of a strange term for it. I knew I was deaf in my right ear long before I bothered to tell anybody else. The rest of my family, well, they had to find out the hard way. Hello. Hi, Mum. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Very well. Good to hear. Well, ironically. So, I was wondering if you would tell me the story of how you found out I was deaf in one ear. Well, initially I actually thought you might have had a vision problem because we would go out into the garden to play and you'd be singing out, Mum, Mum, where are you? And I'd be looking directly at you and going, I'm, I'm right here, can't you see me? And you'd go, no, no, where are you? And I thought, oh, okay. But didn't worry too much about it. And then one day when you were in prep, I took you to the beach. And as mums do, I picked a shell up and held it to your ear and said, oh, what can you hear in the shell? And you just totally, matter of fact, said to me, oh, I can't hear with that ear, and took the shell off me and put it to your other ear. And suddenly it all fell into place. You didn't have a problem with your sight at all. <laughs> you had a problem with your hearing. I didn't need glasses. I needed hearing aids. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a bit of a shock because school, at your school they had done hearing tests only two weeks beforehand and you'd come through with a clear bill of health. So I actually did contact the school afterwards and just uh, told them that... By the way, that, that kid you said had perfect hearing, he's definitely one <laughs> Yeah, that wasn't their fault, but I just wanted them to know that their tests were not at all conclusive. Well, maybe they're the ones who made me deaf. I don't think so. (laughs) (laughs) Eventually, I had my first audiologist appointment where I was given the diagnosis of unilateral hearing loss. In layman's terms... Your right ear is cactus, mate. I've never really thought of myself as disabled, although I do talk about being deaf on stage. I have health problems. I'm deaf in one ear, which is a disability. Technically, not a real one. Not a real disability. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but the half deaf are not getting the same treatment as the other disabled people. Right? There's like, there's no marches to Parliament House for the half deaf. You know, people just like, what do we want? And I'm at the back like, what? You know, that's never. <laughs> Partially deaf does have its perks. I can sleep through anything. Thunderstorms, construction works, you name it, I can ignore it. But recently there's been something I can't ignore. Something so strange, even my ears perked up. Something involving you. To explain what I'm talking about, we have to go back in time to October 2001 in Cupertino, California. We are introducing a product today, and that product is called iPod. The biggest thing about iPod is it holds a thousand songs. I loved my iPod. 
I used to listen to it on the bus to school and on long family road trips. It was the perfect companion, a portable library of my favourite music curated by a team of geeks in the Californian desert. And the technology didn't stop there. Within a few short years, we went from the iPod to the iPhone and with it all the audio you could ever desire. If you sat down to listen to all the music on Spotify alone, it would take you over 200 years. And I'm not including bathroom breaks in that. And the effect of all this audio on demand is pretty crazy. In less than one generation, we've gone from wearing headphones on the bus or on a walk to wearing them everywhere. Talk to any young person. Leaving home without your headphones is like leaving a vital organ behind. So it's the middle of the Melbourne International Comedy Festival. I'm walking around Melbourne looking for people wearing headphones, uh, of which there are a lot, but I'm heading to the State Library because I think that's where a lot of them will congregate, sitting on the lawns, eating, listening to headphones, instead of listening to the beautiful ambient sounds of seagulls and trams. You know, it's funny, actually. I saw someone today wearing sunglasses and headphones and a face mask. It's virtually a sensory deprivation tank at this point. Everyone is completely in their own bubble. So let's see who we find. Excuse me. I'm making a documentary. I was wondering if you had a second to talk. What was your name? Uh, Alina. Alina. And how often do you wear headphones every day? Um, probably based on my day, from when I wake up to basically when I go to sleep. Would you say more than 12 hours? Yeah, definitely. What was your name? Simon. And uh, I see you've got your over here headphones on. You're listening to some music? Yeah, that's right, right, mate. How long would you say you wear headphones for every day? A couple of hours, maybe. Two and a half, three hours. And do you ever wonder about the effects on your health of wearing headphones for that long? I smoke cigarettes, I drink alcohol, I do drugs, so I'm not really worried about what the headphones are doing. The iPod and streaming on demand culture that it introduced had an unintended consequence. It turns out that prolonged exposure to noise, specifically louder than usual noise, like the kind an iPod makes, can have irreversible consequences for your hearing. Now, some basic hearing biology. The inside of your ear is lined with these things called hair cells. They're not actually hair per se, but since they kind of look like tufts of hair, that's what we call them. Not to be confused with the hair in old men's ears. Now, your hair cells wiggle when air stimulates your eardrum. That wiggling is processed by the brain as sound. To make things easier, just imagine the inside of your ear is occupied by the wiggles. Everybody loosen up. Let's get ready to wiggle. Normally, the wiggles do a bang-up job. Sound comes in, they get down to wiggling, and that information gets passed along to your brain. But when you listen to something at an incredibly high volume... Those little wiggles, eventually, they stop wiggling. And unlike Jeff, they don't wake back up. That's what it looks like inside my deaf ear. A wiggle massacre. And it's not just adults who are listening to music at high volumes. The Hearing Loss Association of America estimates that 12.5% of children between the ages of 6 and 19 have irreversible hearing loss thanks to headphone use. A study in the Netherlands of children aged 9 to 11 found that over 14% of children had some degree of hearing loss from their device usage. That's a lot of dead wiggles. Okay, I can sense your scepticism, especially those of you listening to this with your headphones on. How bad could these things really be? They're everywhere. I thought the same thing at first. That's why I sought out Dr. Luke Campbell, the CEO of Neurophones, a Melbourne-based headphone company and the winner of the Prime Minister's Prize for Science. Yeah, my story is I'm a medical doctor by training and had started doing the ear, nose and throat surgery training program, objective tests of hearing, so it's tests of hearing that don't require you to push a button. That was a bit more specific to a cochlear implant context, um, but still picked up the background knowledge required to think, well, everyone I'm walking around with every day all knows that everybody hears differently, so how can we take this cool technology from the lab and actually make it something that the everyday person can benefit from. Unfortunately, consumers like louder music and they will always say a louder sounding headphone sounds better regardless of anything else. Why do we like more salt, more sugar, more anything like that? Sound of music is the same as uh, 
any other addictive substance. Uh, there are a lot of things that have forced the headphone industry to pay more attention to it and a lot of things which just due to technological advances are almost accidentally helping with it. It's been you know, over a decade since the European Union put in place controls on how loud a, a headphone can be. What Luke is saying is that, at least in the EU, this issue is being looked at carefully. Luke said that the EU has rules for device manufacturers which limit the amount of volume they can pump out. That's all well and good, but what about the people who've already got device-induced hearing loss? The way I see it, we need to look at adaptation. The next generation has to be prepared to deal with hearing loss. They need leadership. Ideally, someone who already has hearing loss. This person has to be funny, charismatic, successful, somebody well-versed in the media. Maybe some kind of comedian. Somebody on the radio, for sure. Luckily, I know just the man for the job. My name is DJ Demers, and I am a stand-up comedian. <laughs> so uh, I'll let you guys know right off the bat, I wear hearing aids. I got them in both ears. Uh, they are fake. I got them for comedy. And uh, <laughs> I was running low on material, so... Um, no, they're, uh, they're real. I've had them since I was four years old. I'm deaf, man. Uh, I'm, I'm hard of hearing. I'm not full deaf, of course. I've had full-on deaf people get mad at me for calling myself deaf. They've come up to me after shows. They're like, you're not deaf. You're hard of hearing. We're deaf. You're not. <laughs> All right. I don't want no trouble here, you know. I'm just a couple dead batteries away from being on your team, okay? Come on. I am originally from Canada. Yeah, live in Los Angeles now, but originally from the great city of Kitchener, Ontario, Canada. So one of the reasons I was fascinated to talk to you is you're one of the few, possibly the only high-profile comedian I know with profound hearing loss. I was wondering, what, what exactly is your diagnosis of hearing loss? I think it's sensorineural hearing loss, but the the doctors aren't weren't entirely sure because it kind of went on me at a young age and they're not sure if I was born that way or I had a lot of ear infections when I was young, so they're not sure if those contributed to it. But I think the official diagnosis, as far as I know, would be sensorineural hearing loss, severe to profound. When my hearing aids are out, I'm like deaf for all intents and purposes. I'm not hearing anything. Like when I go to audiologists who aren't my own, or if I get a new doctor and they're seeing my hearing chart for the first time, they are always blown away by how well I can function in society based on how deaf I am. So you got into stand-up comedy how many years ago? 2009, 13 years ago. 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. And did you immediately talk about being deaf on stage? Mm, no, I remember it being, it weighed on me because I, I knew I didn't want to just, I mean, I ended up making a joke about it, how I didn't want to be the hearing aid guy. But no, I, I remember like really making an effort to let audiences know I was funny without talking about it. And then I got comfortable with the idea because it is a big part of my life. And I said, why the hell not? It, it's, there's a lot of funny stuff that happens from it. So in the beginning, no, but pretty quickly I, I started talking about them. There's a few comedians who came before me, who came before us, who, who do have hearing aids or hearing loss and talk about it, but nobody really... Um, it's not like a part of the, the broader discourse of... Nobody talks about it because it's usually old people who have hearing loss. So for somebody to be young-ish and talk about it, I think, is a pretty pretty cool thing. It's I, If anybody can see themselves on stage when the comedian's talking, I think that's a cool thing. I think you're right. I think there is also an air of embarrassment still being young and having hearing loss. You do feel as if you're in some way morally culpable for your hearing loss, like, oh, I'm too young to have this, whereas it's just any, it's like any other illness. You wouldn't be worried that you would upset people or they'd think you were uncool if, like, your legs didn't work. Yeah, it's true. I'm, 
one time that I was golfing and they paired me up with a random dude and he was an older guy, maybe like 70 years old and he had hearing aids. So I was like, Hey, I have hearing aid too. And I went to give him a fist bump and he like, wouldn't give me the fist bump and he, he wouldn't even acknowledge that he had hearing aids cause he was embarrassed about them. And I remember that was like a, an aha moment for me. Cause I was like, Oh, people really are and almost more so if you're older and it, it comes later. Like for me, I don't remember life without it, but I can imagine being whatever age, 70 or something and having to wear them for the first time. It's probably like tied in with a sense of mortality and and just getting older. So there's all sorts of feelings that come along with hearing aids and they're all legitimate. So that's why I think the number one goal for me is to always be funny. But if you can tap into these sorts of emotions and and be a, a conduit for that, that's a pretty cool feeling. Have you noticed your hearing loss affecting your stagecraft at all? So one of the things I've been told is that I tend to stand on this sort of an angle when I'm performing. And apparently I didn't even pick this up till someone pointed it out. It's probably because I'm trying to hear the laughter Mm. and I'm sort of angling. Do you notice that it's affected you on stage in any way? I know if I'm doing crowd work and I'm talking to the crowd, I definitely like push my left ear out because my left ear is better. When I'm just telling my jokes regularly, I'm not sure if it's affected my posture or... I'm sure it's affected my cadence and delivery in ways I don't even know because they're probably some of the same ways it's affected my regular everyday speech. But I I don't know. I don't know if it's affected my posture or anything like that. But definitely crowd work. I'm, I'm putting my left ear out. And I also will like get right to the edge of the stage and try to get as close to the person I'm talking to as possible because... I want to yeah, hear. I do that one too. Yeah. I found it was a bit of a superpower coming up when you'd be playing these crappy bar shows and people would yell out. I just never responded to them. Half the time I didn't hear them. Same. And I had people come up to me and go, wow, you're unflappable. You didn't even respond to that guy. Like, what guy? <laughs> yeah. Same. It is a superpower. I agree. You're unheckleable. No, I have a disability. I'm deaf in one ear. I'm half deaf. How can you tell? How can I tell? Yeah. I can't fucking hear it on you. That's how I can say <laughs> What? I didn't realize that Americans were as stupid as on the news. But that, that was the dumbest thing I've ever heard. How did you get across the road to come in here? How can I tell? Whisper in my ear. I won't be able to hear it. Why am I totally deaf? I wish I fucking was now. I asked DJ what advice he'd have for a young person dealing with hearing loss for the first time. I got my hearing aids so young and dealt with hearing loss at such a young age that I had such a good support system set up that my my parents and my family were so accommodating and never made me feel like different and that was very helpful because I've, I've worked with a charity here in LA who deal with, they help children with hearing loss and, and a lot of times their families aren't equipped to, I mean, sometimes it's as simple as they're not even equipped to get them hearing aids. So they're, they're behind the eight ball from, from an actual like physiological, not physiological, but from a, a technological perspective. And then emotionally, they might not be set up to help them and there's stigma around it. So I was lucky enough that I didn't deal with any of that because my family was there for me. So if you're going through that at 30 or 40 and, and hearing has been a part of your identity, probably something that you took for granted, I can imagine that that would, would be a huge blow to the ego and, and your, your sense of worth and all these things would be very difficult. So I guess my advice would be the same advice I would give anybody going through any sort of hardship is to not be too hard on yourself um, and make sure that you're advocating for yourself. I think if you still, while you're going through this negative experience, try to be a source of positivity with everybody you meet, people will be more accommodating than you might expect because people want to help people who make them feel good. But if after listening to this, you're worried about your hearing, Here are a few practical tips. One, spend some time without headphones on. Humanity didn't evolve to be swaddled in surround sound. 
Try a digital detox once in a while. Walk around with your ears uncovered. Listen to the world. There's almost no sponsored ad breaks in the park. Two, buy good quality headphones. Headphones are like cars. The lower the price, the worse off you'll be in an accident. Look for devices with features like noise cancelling and automatic volume limits. Three, keep the volume down. A good rule of thumb when wearing headphones is to keep the sound below seven clicks on your volume button. Anything over that is going to damage your ears. A handy rhyme to help you remember, over seven, wiggles go to heaven. Or, as the wiggles would put it, Hush, little baby, don't say a word. Daddy's gonna buy you a mockingbird. And if that mockingbird don't sing, well, Daddy's gonna buy you a diamond ring. Hear Me Out was written and produced by David Rose. The sound engineer was Brendan O'Neill. And now for a story all about corporate culture, the tribal nature of AFL football in Melbourne, and alienation. A lone figure stands at the edge of a vast room, baffled by the invisible rules which dictate the movement of his colleagues, as they make their way around the vast expanse, known as Conference Room B. Here's writer Mitchell Welsh with the Pick a Side exercise. They keep asking the same question over and over, re-springing the same social trap. At first I try to deflect it with humour. Fitzgray, I say. Or Footsroy. Collingdon. Essenwood. Richmantle. Freeman, I don't know. But word games alone aren't enough to dissuade the exceedingly earnest, excessively numerous interrogators of Conference Room B. Hi, I'm Andy from Corporate, says one fellow, handshake rippling with a disconcerting eagerness of grip. And I'm not at all ashamed to say I'm a long-time supporter of the Melbourne Demons. Melbourne Demons? More like the Melbourne Dreamons, I reply. Reflexively, not sure if it even means anything. It seems like the kind of thing I'm supposed to say at this juncture, and it has the basic rhythm and shape of a joke slow motion heartbeat on treading water staring into Andy from corporate's blank face but then he cracks a smile releases me from the handshake slaps me on the back and moves on it worked I know it's only supposed to be a getting to know you team building type exercise this process of dividing up the workplace by AFL allegiances but I'm worried about what it is these new teammates of mine are going to get to know. Way down in the depths of my non-substantial core, I'm different. Adrift, teamless, non-tribal, unaligned, indifferent to sports on almost every level. Another coworker approaches. I try the Melbourne Dream Ons line again, but already the words have started to lose any semblance of shape and meaning. The Melbourne Demons, more like the Belmont, uh, I mean the Melbourne Dermans, the Merple, uh, oh God, I'm getting desperate here. I start pleading unashamedly, listen, please, I'm from Queensland. I've only been in Melbourne a few weeks. Hey, listen, it's okay, they say. There's no shame in barracking for the Brisbane Lions as long as you don't mind being in a minority of one. (laughs) All around me, Conference Room B is self-assembling into tribes. The fault lines are charged with kinetic energy. How do I even begin to explain that I don't follow Aussie rules football? That I don't follow any sports at all? I spot a familiar face in the clamorous crowd. 
It's Annette from Accounts. I grab her by the yellow and black stripes of her woolen scarf. Thank God. Listen, you have to help me. I don't know anything about football. I'm from Queensland. You understand? I don't follow the Lions, or the Tigers, or the Bears. Annette, please. I can't find my team because I don't have a team. Oh, she says, her expression shifting from shock through repugnance to total unmitigated pity. You poor thing. You're from Queensland? Listen, I probably shouldn't be telling you this, but there is a place here for people like you. She motions to a far corner of the crowded conference hall group of thick-necked and downtrodden men drink water from paper cups. Over there, she says, that's the sideline. That's where you poor, wretched rugby fans belong. I don't get it. I don't follow rugby either. I don't follow soccer. I don't follow. I don't belong. I don't belong. I don't belong. I don't belong. The world goes long. I'm floating above conference room B, looking down on the whole corporate scrum, or ruck, or whatever you call it. Chaos turns slowly to order. People find each other, embrace, and form ranks. Even the most obscure teams have strength in numbers. They make signs and flags with whiteboard markers and butcher's paper and hang them on the carpeted walls. And here I am, floating in space, a man outside the order of things. A lost little boy, stuck outside the MCG without a ticket. And footy season in Melbourne is always brutal cold. Pick a Side Exercise was written and read by Mitchell Welsh from his series Modern Cons. This story was first broadcast in 2016 on RN's Pocket Docs. The sound engineer was Russell Stapleton. So that news I mentioned up top? We're changing earshot up a bit and we want you, dear listener, maker, radio and pod enthusiast, to send us your stories. We're making a season of episodes around a theme. First up, promises. Spoken or unspoken, broken or kept. Personal stories, a government that fails its citizens. Tales of love, revenge, hope and betrayal. And don't forget the funny ones. You can pitch an idea you want to make or just a great story you heard you want us to make. Head to the Earshot website, abc.net.au slash radionational slash programs slash Earshot. Or just Google it. The pitch form is down the bottom of the page. Get in touch with your story. Promise me. I'm Miyuki Okiranta, and this is Earshot. You've been listening to an ABC podcast. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.